Hey guys, Chris Starry here. Today I'm going to take you through all the number one picks in AFL VFL history and I'm going to put them into a tier list and rank them from first to last. So let's get started. Okay, so to go through the number one picks. So first up, so I'm going Luke Hodge number one. So Nick Rewalt, he's in the conversation and it's a 1A, 1B scenario. But for me, I'm probably taking Luke Hodge over Nick Rewalt, where I'm just thinking, well, it's not just about the premierships, but it's about the impact he had towards his team developing and, I guess, winning those premierships. And probably for me, where a Hodge just surpassed a Rewalt, if I am to sort of see where is that final bit of separation, is probably when Hodge joined Brisbane, where you look at, well, he won the premierships at Hawthorne, meaningful contribution, terrific footballer, fair enough. But having those two years in Brisbane, just helping develop that group from really the ground up in such a hurry and sort of instilling that culture, I think that really, I guess, cements Hodge's legacy as that number one guy, if I'm to sort of go into, well, what separates them. So who might have been the better footballer? Yeah, probably Rewalt in terms of just sheer footballing ability, but the, I guess, additional edge Hodge has as a leader gives him for me that ever so slight edge if I'm to sort of put it down into that sort of minute detail but in terms of contenders in terms of well who was actually the best in the 2001 draft well in terms of talent well Ablett by far and away is that number one talent number one I guess footballer I suppose to put it that way but um, and look, you had a Chris Judd who he played 279 games, I believe it was. So not as many games as Ablett, didn't have as long of a peak. Um, so I would definitely go Ablett out of those two. So it's really a, is it a Hodge or is it an Ablett scenario? So it, 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 I'd sort of put it down to, well, it depends on what you need. So do you want that leader? If you need the leader, you get Hodge. If you want the best footballer, you've got Ablett. So it just depends on sort of, I guess, what you've got around you. But um, for Hawthorne, Hodge was definitely the guy they needed. And in terms of premierships, well, I don't think if you switched Hodge and Ablett that Hawthorne would have won as many. But conversely, if Hodge was with Geelong, well, Geelong sort of already had that leadership. So whether he or Ablett would have been more valuable, well, I think Ablett was probably more than fine and probably won as many, if not more, than what Hodge would have with Geelong. So... Um, yeah, I, I think they both ended up in the right spots ultimately. But yeah, who's the number one? It really depends on your criteria. So do you want talent? Do you want leadership? And um, how much does that, I guess, leadership impact help towards winning in terms of like the development of other players, development of culture? So um, it's really a personal preference one. And maybe I'll do a run through in the future of who I would take number one in each of these drafts. So you might be able to see there and then who I would take number one because I'd need to really sleep on that one that's for sure so number two so nick rewalt pretty straightforward that is ahead of these next guys on this list so 336 games outstanding career one of the great key forwards of all time period so um in terms of contenders who's that next best in the draft well sean burgoyne for me just with the volume of work consistency over the course of his career the versatility the impact the clutch gene as some would put it just lifting his game when the team needs it great career absolutely for me a clear number two in that 2000 draft so um number three so i've got a brendan goddard so this sort of i guess goes against what some of my espn colleagues believe where some of them are actually of the mindset that yeah maybe a matt rao could be that number number three guy in the draft and look he's got that opportunity but at this stage, with Rao just playing the five games, we don't know what his durability will be like. Will he make that 300-game mark? Will he even make 250 games? It's a bit early to say. So for me, I'm still going to back Goddard, where he's had the great career, consistency over the course of his career, peak performance, phenomenal. Um, so absolutely, he's the number one pick from his draft. And probably that next best would be probably a Jared McVeigh. And great career, but for me not in Goddard's class where Goddard was just one of those you can play him just about anywhere impact players and was a big time difference maker came up big in big games was great in particularly those grand finals that he played so yeah great career from Goddard and it'll be hard for any of these young guys to really displace him but a few of them have that chance but given his play that 300 plus games they'll play it conservative and say he's that number three guy at this point so 
Number four, so we could really look at any number of these guys. Where is it Jamara? Is it Matt Rowell? Is it Sam Walsh? At the moment, I'm going Jamara at number four, and speculative given we haven't seen him play, obviously. And in terms of the contenders, well, Logan McDonald, he could be as good, maybe even better than a Eugle Hagen. So that's something to watch as well. So I've got it sort of as a 1A, 1B, slightly prefer Eugle Hagen, but um, McDonald's right on his heels. So that's definitely something to watch. And then we've got a Will Phillips where, look, he's the best midfielder in the draft for mine. He'll have the most immediate impact, I'm suspecting. Um, so yeah, he's another to watch. Um, certainly early days, there'll be a few that'll advocate possibly Will Phillips is the best from 2020. But with key forwards, we're looking at, well, who are they four years from now? And that's really when we'll have a bit of an idea as to, well, who are those guys who should be in that conversation as best from 2020? Particularly with some of those top end sort of tolls from the year where you've got guys like Riley Thilthorpe or you've got others as well. So maybe it's a Denver Granger Barras. So we don't know yet. So, um, so 2019, I'd, still be taking a Matt Rowe number one. I only played the five games, but when he played, well, he was playing to a best and fairest standard for Gold Coast. And some would have said maybe he could have featured in the top five, maybe top 10 in the Brownlow. I don't think he would have quite, I guess, remained at that level. I think with a few more games, clubs would have really taken more notice, given him more respect and played him a bit harder and made life a bit harder. But I think he'll be an absolute star for Gold Coast for a very long time. As long as his body holds up, that'll be the key. But um, he'll be a leader for Gold Coast. He'll be a great player. So the other contenders for best, um, for me, I'd probably have Tom Green as that next best guy at this stage in the 2019 draft, where he had that one game of 20 contested, or I think it was even over 20 contested possessions. And just his inside game, I think once GWS really give him that consistency of games, I think he'll be an absolute beast. So... It's an early call. He hasn't played much footy either, um, just without those opportunities with GWS having such a stacked midfield. But he's someone where I absolutely believe that he'll be a really good midfielder. So he's someone to watch over the next few years as a potential breakout player. So next up, Noah Anderson, consistent first season, but kept getting better over the course of the year. So he's someone to watch. I, I, I don't think he'll be quite as good as a Rowell or a Green. I don't think he's quite on that level, but he's someone where he can keep developing and be a really good player. So he, he could be in that conversation, but probably not at this stage, that guy. And then Caleb Sarong winning the Rising Star has to be in the conversation. He's had a phenomenal first year, but being that smaller mid, and look, you could make the same argument with a row, but does he necessarily have that same upside? So we'll have to wait and see. But for me, it's probably this order. One, two, three, four. So... So next up, so Sam Walsh, I'm looking at him as probably not that number one pick from the draft, but I think he'll have a phenomenal career. And looking at sort of where he ranks compared to some of these other guys, I've probably got him as that number six in terms of quality amongst sort of all these guys. And look, a bit like with Jamara, Raul, it is early career. We have to see how's his body going to hold up over the long term. But at this stage, there's no particular concerns for me. He'll, he looks set to be probably Carlton's Maybe number one, but probably more likely number two mid behind Cripps, realistically for me. But um, yeah, looking at the other contenders, so Jack Lacocious, he'd be my number one still from 2018. Um, he was leading the meters game for a period there. And just in terms of kicking, just that, I guess, best kick in the draft, he'll develop more as an interceptor and he's got that elite endurance. So he gives you options where you could play him forward, wing, you could do whatever you want with Lacocious. He's someone where you'd want five of him on your team and you could just do anything with him. But the others I'd have in that mix, so Bailey Smith, I'm still of the belief, and I said this at the time of the draft, that Bailey Smith is the best mid in that 2018 draft. And yeah, I still can't sort of, I guess, change my position on that because what Bailey Smith was doing this year was phenomenal and really justified that. But it will be interesting to see how his midfield minutes go next year with, I guess, the addition of Troll or Dunkley wants those extensive midfield minutes, so we'll see what happens there. Um, but then, yeah, a Max King, some would make an argument for being that best player in the draft, maybe even the best young player in the comp, so that'll be interesting. Um, for me, he's probably that number three guy. I'd probably go Walsh number four if I'm doing a redo just sort of quickly in my mind. But, yeah, with a King, he's probably going to be that best key forward of the draft if you're going to have a Lacocious in defense, and he's certainly a number one option. And, yeah, look, give him a few more years, he could be a monster. So 
Um, that's definitely something to watch. So next up, so Jacob Wiedering, um, he's, I'd probably have him number seven in this order. Um, he, he looks like he'll have a great career. He's sort of already that All-Australian standard key defender. So, um, And then you look at the others. Well, is it Clayton Oliver? Is it Josh Dunkley? You could go any of the three. If I had to pick, probably Clayton Oliver just on sort of what he's done to date. But Jacob Wiedering definitely has a case. But different positions, hard to compare different positions. I'm still an Oliver fan, and he had a really good season this year. Started sort of taking on the game more, being a bit more damaging by foot. So you could go either way, but um, when in doubt, I don't know, you'd usually sort of take the midfielder. But yeah, so for me, slightly Clayton, but Jacob Wiedering is definitely in the mix. Maybe a Josh Dunkley if he keeps developing, but yeah, probably just doesn't quite have the hurt factor to quite be that guy. Um, so number eight, so yeah, I'm probably looking at a Andy McGrath where um, I think he can probably be that guy. I really like him in defense still. I know Essendon fans want to see him sort of through the midfield and whatnot, but I think he could be a great defender if he was used there. Where in, Looking at what he did one-on-one -on -one in his first year, well, he had, the, I think, the best one-on-one -on -one win rate of any defender, and he's obviously got that run, can generate that drive. So you've got that option and with Essendon's decimated defense maybe they should look to that at some stage but play him through the midfield he's going to be a good midfielder too so um, in terms of those other contenders to me 2016 is a really wide open draft where we've got a lot of really good guys but there's not that clear best guy so a Tim Taranto maybe he's the best midfielder um, humor Gluggage breakout year terrific is probably that best on the outside um, Jai Simkin, terrific year, breakout year. He could be in that mix as maybe that best midfielder. Um, Jared Berry, he's a tall mid. He's already terrific, so maybe he has scope to get even better. So he's firmly in that mix. You've got a Tom Stewart who to date would be that standout performer, but he's probably that five or so years older. So would he be the number one? Well, probably not, but he'd have to play to 35, 36, 37, maybe 38, <laughs> even to really definitely be that guy. But yeah, look, if you've got a Brett Harvey playing so late in his career or Sean Burgoyne still going around, well, you'd never say never with that. But in terms of immediate performance, I'd go a Stewart, but because he's those years older, probably it's unlikely he'll be that number one guy long term. Um, so you've got a Jordan Ridley, so best and fairest this year, breakout player. Um, he'll be a really good defender for a long time, so maybe he could be the guy. Probably not, but maybe. And then you've got a Rowan Marshall as well, where terrific Ruckman. In terms of guys younger than Grundy, he's probably that best guy. So um, and in terms of where he ranks currently in the AFL, is he that third best Ruck, fourth best, fifth best? is probably, for me, a top five, where it's sort of probably a Grundy and Gorn in whatever order. You've got a Nick Nutt, probably a Goldstein still while he's still playing good footy, but Marshall's probably that sort of other guy after them. So, yeah, they're sort of my A-tier prospects. And, yeah, and, and it's tricky because so many of these guys are so young where with all these really, I guess, four to eight guys, it really depends so much on how durable will they be? How are they going to develop? Very speculative, but um, these guys still have that, I guess, opportunity to be 300 gamers. So they do have that opportunity to perhaps pass by some of these, I guess, top three, who for me are pretty solid top three. But with that A tier, I really wanted to go with those who are either those 300 gamers or have that, I guess, best chance to make that sort of level of performance and also that sort of, I guess, span of career as well. So, because you really want bo both. You want the, I guess, prime performance, but you also want that, I guess, consistency over the career and that longevity as well, where I, I think they're real keys. So next up we have our B tier. So it's taken about five attempts not to say beer tier so i'm glad that that's the case but um yeah going to number nine so we've got Lockie whitfield so um 150 games um will he make that 300 game mark i think it's probably a bit unrealistic given his age and stage where as a 28 year old can he play another 150 games i don't think so so i think he needs to be in this tier here but um in terms of well is he the best in his draft well He's in the conversation. He's certainly, I guess, been that sort of, I guess, premier outside midfielder. So that does need to be taken into consideration. But in terms of who I would who I would pick and who that certainly number one contender is, if you're a Whitfield fan, well, I'd probably personally take Brodie Grundy number one, where I'm looking at him as 
possibly that best ruckman in the competition where really it comes down to well where I separate them is he's in that sort of same tier as a gone a Nick Nutt but I'm seeing his durability as being on another level where just comparing say a Grundy to a gone well Grundy's already surpassed gone in games played and is three years younger so in terms of volume of work I'm certainly taking a Grundy so and I, I don't tend to put outside players in such high regard, relatively speaking, where if you were to look at midfielders, well, all the best midfielders are inside midfielders, be it a Gary Ablett, a Chris Judd, Dustin Marden, Nat Fife, I could go on. So all those sort of guys are Scott Pendlebury, Joel Selwood, so the list goes on. So all the best midfielders are really inside midfielders. So I find I don't give outside midfielders quite as much credit, relatively speaking, at least. Whereas with a Ruckman, well, it's something you need and you want them to be durable. And I look at a Grundy as more durable than a Whitfield. So I'd back him by career's end to play more games. But there were signs from Gr from Grundy that he was slowing down this year. So if indeed he is slowing down and a Whitfield can remain durable, which is a query for me at this stage, given some of his recent years and the number of games he's missed, we'll, we'll just have to see how that pans out. But by end of career, it'll take probably till the end of their careers to really know who is that true number one from 2012. So we we next have a Brett Deledio where, yeah, you could probably have him ahead of a Whitfield. Certainly at this stage you would among a number of these other guys, but I would hope a Whitfield can get another certainly 100 plus games out of him if he does i'd probably have him ahead of a deledio but if he doesn't make at least 250 games well you have to start moving him down so that'll be sort of where that tiebreaker is for me but yeah looking at a deledio well great career but who was the best in the draft well clearly it was buddy but with a deledio i really respect his game and it's a bit like a whitfield where whitfield you can play him whether it's sort of in an outside midfield role you can play him across half back half forward he'll impact games and it's a bit the same with a deledio as well where you could play him across any of those three lines and he's a real impact player so um, and he was really durable for a lot of his career but just at the very tail end that's where his durability sort of tape it off a bit so um that was unfortunate that we haven't had those sort of final years of him and he could have had some great years at gws but yeah unfortunately yeah his body just didn't hold up but um we knew with his time at richmond well when he was playing for richmond it was a case of well when he was playing they were winning and when he was missing well yeah they weren't so um that's how influential he was so yeah credit for a great career but yeah i'd say probably a whitfield is slightly the better player but you could go either way on that. So the Richmond fans or whoever who say Deledio is the better player in terms of peak of powers, yeah, fair enough. But yeah, just with a Whitfield, I just look at well, what he's done so far has just been a more consistent best, I suppose. But both are terrific and they both deserve firmly to be in this B-grade bracket. But of course, I don't think either will be 300 gamers. So for me, they're not in that A bracket. And I think we'll find with a lot of these as well, where if some of these guys don't make those numbers, well, they could more than easily move down below a lot of these guys but it's just speculative it's that early where look these guys do have the opportunity to play 300 so i do want to give them that credit but moving on so mark murphy at number 11 so um why is he here well not quite the impact player of a deledio so i do have to put him below but terrific midfielder long career he's been terrific so i have to give him that much credit but who's the best in the draft well pretty clearly it's pendlebury so he's got the more games played but he's got the premiership he's been a captain um just a better footballer so that's a pretty straightforward one next up adam cooney peak of performance i'd put him ahead of a murphy but just with a murphy you've got the extra durability a bit more consistency over the span of works so i do prefer a murphy there but um, with Acuni, look, was he the best in his draft? Well, certainly Pika Powers, again, best in his draft. But in terms of span of work and consistency over the career, I've got Mundy. So if I could have either or for the career, I'd go Mundy personally. But again, it's a judgment call. What do you value? That's sort of, a, yeah, up to you, really. So number 13, I've got a Jeff White. So slightly above a Bryce Gibbs. But yeah, for me, a White, he was one of the better Ruckman during his years. So... 
Um, yeah, for me, yeah, he's probably that number 13 guy. Maybe some would even say, maybe you could argue putting him ahead of some of these other guys, and fair enough. Would he stack up as well today? Probably not, but um, yeah, certainly during his time, good pick. And was he the best in his draft? Some might argue that. Um, I prefer from the same team, Uze, personally, and even a Shannon Grant deserves to firmly be in that conversation. So... Um, Grant probably a little more consistent than an Uze, but Uze at the peak of his powers, I slightly prefer, but splitting hairs there, you could go with either. So, yeah, again, judgment call. So number 14, I've got a Bryce Gibbs. So for me, Gibbs is someone I feel has sort of had a bad rap and been pretty unfairly sort of rated amongst sort of the AFL community and fans alike, so... Um, and I think he got a pretty raw deal with Adelaide, honestly, where he's someone where he's always had that durability, but again, a bit like someone like a, let's say a Whitfield or Deledio, well, across all three lines, whether it's midfield, defense, forward, he can impact games and he's been a good player. So you can play him across half forward, good delivery inside 50, racks it up. You can play him through the midfield. Again, he'll win enough of it, but good skills all that, you can put him behind the ball and he'll win his one-on-ones, which is something people don't realize and talk about. Again, good ball use, racks it up, can intercept a little bit. So, um, and I think with an Adelaide, like let's say they thought, oh, he's not good enough for the midfield or to play across half forward. Well, fine, put him in defense. So I think he's been probably a bit underutilized and yeah, I just think he's probably got a bit of a bad rap and probably unnecessarily. So, um, but was he the best in his draft? No. That was clearly Joel Selwood. So he's won the premierships, he's been the captain, but from impact start to finish, he's really been that clear guy where from the start, impacting games, so consistent, such a strong performer, has had his durability issues, but still has surpassed that 300 game mark. So definitely credit where it's due, great career. So um, yeah, moving on, I'm looking at a Cam Rayner. So will he be that 250 gamer? Maybe. We'll have to wait and see. But he's someone where I think he'll come good. So I, I think that's what a lot of people miss with a Cam Rayner. Is he a Dustin Martin? Is he a Christian Petraka? No, I don't think he'll reach that standard of play. But will he come good? I think so. He's someone where he's pretty openly admitted he hasn't put in the work that he needed to in his early years, but he's starting to apply himself as the reports that I'm getting. So um, here's someone where give him another, probably I'd say a couple of years and I think he'll really explode. So probably maybe 2022, maybe 2023, I think he'll be a real impact player, both as a forward and as a mid. I think he'll be that sort of dual guy where he has the contested side of his game. He can impact games high per possession, high impact per possessions. So, and he'll hit the scoreboard as well. So I think he'll be a good impact player for Brisbane and he could be one of those, I guess, bigger bodied inside mids that they've been lacking as well, but he'll keep impacting games forward as well. But as for who's the best in that 2017 draft, well, Aaron Norton and Noah Bolter are probably my 1A, 1B sorts. Norton I'd take at this stage given, I guess, he's had that earlier performance, but it wouldn't be surprising to me if a Noah Bolter surpassed him. I think they're both going to be great key position players for a long time. So that's something to watch. Um, best midfielder, it's pretty clearly Tim Kelly, but um, the hesitation for me in putting Kelly at one is, well, he's five years older than he, these other guys, so he's going to have to play really deep into his 30s to have that real span of work. But um, in terms of the non-key positioners, well, yeah, it's Tim Kelly for me out of that draft. And then we move on. So number 16, so Drew Banfield. So he's played more than 250 games, so he deserves credit in this bracket. In terms of performance, well, yeah, he's certainly better than Rayner at this stage, but I think Rayner might become better. Is he better than a Gibbs? Maybe, and some and West Coast fans will probably argue that he is, but I do like Gibbs. I am a Gibbs fan, so I've got Banfield at number 16, and that's a pretty solid spot. But um, who is the best in that draft? Well, for me, it's Justin Leppage. So less games played, but he's one of the best key defenders of all time. So I think that's a pretty sort of straightforward one. So onto the C graders. So these are guys who have played less than 250 games. And of those that are still playing in the cases of Swallow and Scully, guys who I don't think will reach that 250 mark. So with a Swallow, well, we're looking at a 28-year-old and who's had durability issues. So can he realistically play another game, 100 games? I don't think he will. So um, if he does, well, he can move up a bracket, but I don't think that's likely. 
and he's someone where, look, he impacted games really from the very start, but he has had his injury issues, and he hasn't ever quite developed into the player we hoped. But he's become an able leader, so that's another sort of point of credit towards him. And, yeah, look, in terms of if he wants to maintain this position, well, he'll want to get to around that probably... He'll need to get 200-plus games, certainly. I'd be looking for probably 220-plus to really, I guess, maintain this spot. So we'll see how he goes with that and how his body holds up. But in terms of best from 2010, well, probably Tom Lynch at this stage has the points, but um, he's someone where he really impacted not quite season one, but in that earlier portion. But in more recent years, he's probably dropped off a little bit from that standing. And you've got maybe a Parker and a Gaff who we'll have to see at the end of the careers, but I think it's a three-man race where it's out of those three, where any of them could all things said and done be that guy. But we'll have to see who plays sort of deep into their 30s. And I reckon out of those three, whoever sort of plays longer, gets the more games could be that guy so we'll have to wait and see but it's really best key forward best inside player best outside player so just depends on what you prefer at this stage so you could go either way with any of those guys but 1993 Darren Gasper good pick for his time solid career it, when we when we look back at the 90s a lot, there are a lot of misses so solid pick but who is the best in the draft well for me it's a Brad Johnson so long great career great forward could play a bit of mid too but yeah, he definitely needs to be that guy. He's one of the best sort of smaller forwards of all time, you could say. So, um, yeah, he absolutely deserves credit as that best. But Gasper, good career, good key defender. Um, yeah, no one should be putting him down by any means. So, And particularly, again, for picks in the 90s, we had a lot of misses then because recruiting departments just weren't as big at that time. They weren't as data-driven. They, they just weren't as strong as they are today. So... Travis Johnson, again, pick in the 90s, so um, pretty good pick for his time, but who is the best in the draft? Well, pretty clearly it was Adam Goods, where just the span of work, consistency over the career, but also the peak performance was there. So um, for me, he is pretty clearly that guy, but there were some other good ones in that draft, but for me, I'm taking Goods any day. So 1999, Josh Fraser, good career, not great, but good career, good ruckman, but could play forward as well. and. He's someone where I think he probably should have played more forward than he was and probably remained forward a lot more. And the problem was with Fraser, it's just his body wasn't protected. By the end of his career, it's just he, he couldn't remain, he couldn't continue playing even to his 30s. Like by about 25, his body was shot. So that was the problem there. But early career, he had success. Um, looked really good as a forward and I wish he played a bit more forward than he did and even he could be that sort of tall wing where it's just he's almost like a Dean Cox where he had that endurance good skills could play forward but just didn't quite have that ruck craft where and a good follow-up ruckman that was fine but yeah he just wasn't that sort of tap ruckman he was just a bit light and he just got bullied a bit so but who was the best in that draft well pretty clearly it was Pavlich on another level one of the great key forwards and really you could play him anyway you could play him key back if you wanted to. he was an all-australian early career as a key defender if i recall correctly and he had a number of years as a mid and he was great through there too so um yeah he's one of the greats that just gives you a lot of options and he's really in that nick rewalt conversation where is pavlich or rewalt the best of that sort of period of time well they're both really a 1a 1b in whichever order you decide i I'd really struggle deciding who I'd want out of them, but I'd love either of them on my team. So number 21, we've got a Matthew Cruiser. So is it Fraser? Is it Cruiser? I give Fraser the slight edge because you've got the more games played. At least he's got to the 200 plus. So that's the slight difference. Um, Cruiser the better Ruckman, Fraser the better forward. So um, you're splitting hairs there as to who is better. But um, in terms of best from the 2007 draft though, it's pretty clearly Dangerfield where He's been terrific already. All he's missing is the premiership. And look, if in terms of individual performance, I don't really put premierships as that key criteria. But with the danger field, he's in that dusty category. And he's one of the great contested ball winners, has that burst. So, um, yeah, he's one of the guys where if you could take their careers, then I'd just about be taking danger pretty close to that number one mark in terms of those, I guess, still playing guys. So... Um, yeah, he's obviously obviously been great both as a mid and as a forward. He's really been impactful as well, just as with a Dusty. So he's been great. So um, next up, I've got a Michael Gardner. So um, he could possibly be higher. Um, 
with maybe a cruiser or a Fraser, maybe his peak performance may be slightly higher, but really we're looking at a generation back where they weren't quite as good. So again, you're splitting hairs with really these three Ruckman. Um, some might have Gardner ahead of a Fraser and a cruiser, fair enough for those who do. Um, in terms of the best from that draft, it was a pretty lean draft, but I'm going Russell Robertson as the best from that draft and slightly ahead of a Gardner, where I liked who Gardner was in sort of the early sort of part of his career, but he had his off-field issues. So if you want to include that, I guess, off-field sort of, I guess, detriment to team factor, well, I do put him behind a Fraser and Cruiser, mostly off the back of that. But later in his career, he was still okay, but he wasn't great. So whereas with a Russell Robinson, well, despite, well, Robertson, just looking at his game, well, he's someone where he was that aerial marking threat, hit the scoreboard like crazy, but he was pretty consistent despite his role. So and I think he had one year where he probably got 73 goals, if I recall correctly. So yeah, he had a great career and deserves a lot of credit. And in that lean year, he's probably that number one for me. And then we move down. So I've got a Tom Scully, who was the number one pick. And at the time it was pretty justifiable, but yeah, looking back, well, clearly Dusty is the better player. And look, some would say maybe Fife is the best from that draft. Maybe some might even say Max Gorn, if you're a Ruck advocate, but in terms of games played, he's now got the premiership success, big game performances. I'm going Dusty. Um, much better user than that Fife, who that's always been his problem, even from juniors. And So yeah, I'm a Dusty guy. He's that number one from 2009 pretty clearly, but there are those other two greats that need that, I guess, acknowledgement in Fife and gone, because they are great, and I can't take that away from him. But yeah, with a Scully, look, he's had a good career. He's been a pretty consistent player in the last few years. He's just had injury issues, which has really been the issue. But in terms of commitment to the game, good leader. Um, he's actually been a really good outside player. So yeah, look, you could possibly justify having him higher. And if he plays another, I don't know, if he plays another 20 or so games, 30 or so games, he could move up. But it just depends how much more he plays. But as things sit, he's probably that 23 guy. But yeah, maybe you could move him up. Maybe as high as maybe a 20 maybe even a 19, but yeah, that's sort of his range there. So you could put him anywhere in that range and that's more than fair enough. And it depends on positional preferences as well. Like Ruckman are more scarce, so I put him slightly ahead if I'm to say what sort of determines that. But yeah, with Scully's leadership and attitude, he's that guy who just absolute professional in everything he does. So yeah, you could justify him higher, but for now I'm going to have him at 23. But um, so now we've got our D tier guys. So these are the guys where look, you probably wouldn't want to take them number one realistically, but they haven't had awful careers. So for me, when I was in school, Ds were passes. I don't know about you guys, but um, yeah, for me, Ds were passes, but barely skating through. So, so with a Jack Watts, look, he's sub 175 games. So, and when you're going pick one, you really need to play more than that to justify the selection. So. Um, yeah, that's why I've got him there where he is. Um, but yeah, look, he's been an underrated player for me. Where, look, you can play him, whether it's forward, back, great skills, really good skills. And he's someone where he's got the production, but he's someone where, unfortunately, it's just he went to a bad situation in Melbourne where they didn't have the leadership around him. It wasn't a great scenario for him to develop and too much pressure was put on him. So I think that really took away from what could have been a much better career with the Watts. But yeah, he's still been a good player and um, he's someone where I think he probably could have played a little bit more than he did and been a little better. So, um, But yeah, in terms of best from that draft, I've got Nick Nat. Some might say maybe is it Steele side bottom? Is it a Rory Sloan? There's quite a number of good guys from that um, 2008 draft. But yeah, for me in terms of just sheer influence, um, I'm a Nick Nat guy. So he's been... In terms of just when he's at the peak of his powers, when he's healthy, whew, he's possibly the best Ruckman I've ever seen. So, or I'd probably give him those points as the best Ruckman I've ever seen. Just with the sheer ability to just drag the ball forward, that tackling, just that sheer contested side of his game was just that good and that sort of influential towards winning that he's hard to pass on. And even sort of the contested marking as well. He, he didn't get marks around the ground, but more than half of his marks, it felt like a contested nut. And if I looked at the stats, I'd probably be right there, where it's just he'd go for some ridiculous marks. But yeah, it's just he's all contested, but 
hey, that if you're getting it all contested, well, you're influencing games. So yeah, I love everything about what Nick Knapp brings to the table. So next up, so Des Headland, so good career, really good for Brisbane, probably tapered off a bit when he joined Fremantle, but yeah, he had a few good years with Brisbane where he played some good footy. So he was by no means a bad pick either. But in terms of the better players, and look, this was in the 90s as well. Again, you'll see with a number of the other picks in the 90s, they just weren't as good. So um, yeah, look, it's a respectable pick and Hedlund had a decent career. But in terms of, well, should he have been number one? Well, for me, Lenny Hayes was that clear guy where he was that best midfielder in the draft, best player in the draft, and obviously a longer span of career, longer peak, better peak. So he's the guy. So 26, so Patton, he's had some moments in his career, a few good years, so he deserves some credit for that, but durability's been the issue with him, unfortunately. So, And it's really been a shame where, look, he could have been something like a taller, maybe Tom Hawkins, even a bit more mobile. He was very agile when he came into the competition. So, look, he could have been a really good key forward, but just, yeah, durability's been the problem, so... That's been really unfortunate that we haven't been able to see quite the best of Patton. But yeah, hopefully we get some more games out of him. Where I'm hopeful he can play a few more seasons, get up to maybe the 125, 130. If he can sneak near the 150 mark, that would be incredible. But I don't think that's quite realistic. But yeah, fingers crossed for Patton that he has a few more good years because he, he's a good player when he's up and going. But obviously with so many less games than a Watts or Headland, well, yeah. 26 is the right spot for him. But best in that draft, I'm going Lockie Neal, where he's come off the Brownlow, he's just won it this year, so fantastic for him. He's been a terrific player, very consistent, and I think he's got a lot more good footy in front of him, given what he's done this year and what he's done the last few. And he's durable as well, so that also helps. So number 27, Clive Waterhouse. He's someone where he was taken a bit later. He was someone where he was drafted in his 20s, so he wasn't going to play as many years ultimately, and that's something where in the 90s, well, there just wasn't that awareness in terms of, well, is that an appropriate spot to take someone at that age? But yeah, look, Waterhouse, look, he was a good player and had some good years, but was he a worthy number one? Well, no, <laughs> not really. Not when you've got a guy like a Brett Harvey who has this sort of career. So phenomenal career, most games all time, credit where it's due. So yeah, Harvey's been great. So next up, so we've got a Martin Leslie. So this, I haven't seen Leslie play, but he's someone where it seemed like looking at his stats, he had some good years. But um, in the comment section below, if you've got things to say about his game, you can. But who was the best in that draft? Well, Jar Darren Jarman. He's someone I was fortunate enough to get to see. So one of the best sort of skilled guys all time, really impactful player, great forward. Um, in terms of both delivery to targets, in terms of, just being able to kick some incredible goals. Well, yeah, Jarman's been a great. So, um, and look, there's no one else with more sort of that many more games to really justify taking him ahead of him. But yeah, a Jarman I'd be very happy with, and his career has been great. So next up, so Alex McDonald, 100 plus games. Well, given that was a pick in the 80s, look, you have to respect that. Reasonable enough career. Not a great player, but someone who could play a little bit. So. But best in that draft, well, pretty clearly from 1988, well, it was Chris Grant. So one of the great key forwards, had the length of career, but had the consistency over his career as well. So yeah, during the 90s in particular, but even playing into the 2000s, great key forwards. So credit where it's due, the dogs really got that one right with a late selection there. So next up, so the E class. So these are the ones where, look, these are you have to say it as it is, they're the really failed picks. And with a Tom Boyd, look, he's someone where, again, he could have been that probably Tom Hawkins type where he was just so influential. And to his credit, he had that great grand final. So um, I guess the dogs got that return on investment for paying so much when they traded for him from GWS in that respect. But um, yeah, just it's unfortunate that due to, I guess, mental health issues, he just hasn't been able to continue playing, which is unfortunate because he's someone who really had the potential to be a great footy player. But yeah, unfortunately, that's the way it goes sometimes. So um, yeah, so in terms of the best in that draft, well, for me, it's a 1A, 1B scenario. I've got Bont at this stage, but Patrick Cripps is on his tail. So they're the two great players from that. Some might say a Josh Kelly, but um, just his durability in recent years, for me, just puts him behind those two. So 
Um, yes, yeah, so that's 2013. So, and then we've got 1991. So John Hudden, I didn't see him play. I was born in 1991. So yeah. So you've got a Shane Crawford. So he was the best from that draft. Um, 300 plus great games, great career. Brownlow won a premiership at the very end for Hawthorne. So yeah, he was terrific. So 32, I've got a Paddy McCartan, so 35 games. He still wants to make a comeback to AFL level, but he's an unfortunate case of, well, he's just had all those concussions. So it's not all on him that he hasn't developed. Concussions are a real thing, and it's a big thing. So it can put anyone out of their careers. So, um, yeah, that's been an unfortunate reality for him. And he's someone where, look, he probably shouldn't have been the number one pick in fairness in his draft year, where, look, having... I believe he has diabetes as well, if I recall correctly, or something like that. So it's just when you've got those health issues, it's just hard to justify, particularly when you've got a, the likes of a Petraka and a Heaney, where they were just such good players in that year. So um, although McCarden was as well, but he was just that shorter sort of key forward. Yeah, it's just, yeah, he shouldn't have been pick one. But yeah, look, he was pretty clearly amongst all draft boards, someone who would have been for everyone really a top five or at least top six sort of guy in his year but yeah unfortunately due to concussion yeah it wasn't to be and he just couldn't develop as a result but yeah we'll see if he makes a comeback maybe he plays vfl or i'm not i haven't kept track of where he's going to play his footy next year but yeah hopefully he plays in the vfl or something like that and he has a pretty good year and maybe he can come back onto the radar as a possible but yeah in terms of who's the best from the 2014 draft well i copped a bit at the time when I believe it was in 2018 when I said, yeah, I'd take Petraka and then I'd take Heaney and I'd do so ahead of a Dugowie, but I'm sticking to that. And it's really shone through with the way Petraka really broke out this year. And he's someone where he's always had that contested side to his game, really high volume contested. And he's someone where he's also been high impact per possession, but he's been able to build his endurance and now he can play through the midfield and really provide that burst out of stoppages. So. Um, yeah, he's become a real player and I called him the preseason. This would be his year and he's broken out. So credit to him for becoming really such a good player. And an Isaac Heaney, look, he's someone where he had that success really earlier on. We missed out on seeing him this year, but he's someone where with a Petraka, maybe if you give him more midfield time, maybe he could be in that conversation. But yeah, Petraka for me is the number one. But yeah, so moving on, so Anthony Bannock, so again, not someone that I've had the fortune of seeing, but the best from those that draft, well, it's out of Wanganeen and Peter Matera, so who's the guy? I'd go Wanganeen, given you've got the extra 47 games, but yeah, Matera, great on the wing, credit where it's due. Wanganeen, great mid, later in his career played in defence, but had that consistency still later on in his career, so... Yeah, slight points for me to Wanganeen, but the Matera fans, fair enough. He was definitely a great, so he deserves that acknowledgement, and that's why he's listed there. So Richard Lauder, again, haven't seen, can't comment on his game, but um, Brendan Gale, so he's someone where he was a great ruckman, could play key forward and play as a key forward really well, hit the scoreboard, take a contested grab. So for me, he's that number one from that pick, but... Yeah, during those times, and as we're seeing with so many of these guys taken, sort of when they were drafted in the 80s, in the 90s, we're not seeing that same hit rate. And that's just because recruiting departments weren't what they are today. So whether it's just analytics, whether it's the size of the recruiting department, there just wasn't that focus. You just had probably one person who was just picking him. You didn't have a recruiting team back then. So, um, so next up, so last but really least, I suppose. Well, Harrison Reed. So I, I couldn't find any data on him playing any games. So I, I, I'm taking it that he played no games. But yeah, who was the best in that draft? Well, pretty clearly it's James Hurd. So he's definitely that number one guy. And <laughs> going with such a late pick at that time, well, it really just speaks to well how the draft was at that time. We're just, there wasn't that level of scouting. So yeah, but so questions of interest. So really what I guess going through all these names takes us to, well, is it a mistake to take a key forward number one? So if we look back at some of the guys who have, so Paddy McCarden, well, in hindsight, we look at that as a mistake, but is it all McCarden's fault? No, concussion isn't the fault of the player. It's just that it happens in football and it's a really unfortunate way to see the career of someone go. And it's the same with a Boyd where when you've got mental health issues and it's just I guess you're struggling with whether it's depression, anxiety, or whatever the case may be. Well, it's just hard. It's I know people in my own life that struggle with that, and it's debilitating. So um, absolutely, it's 
sort of not all on Boyd, and it's not necessarily all on GWS or Bulldogs trading for him that he hasn't necessarily lived up to the career that if you looked at his game as a junior, you would have thought, yeah, maybe he'd achieve. So um, that's fair enough. And then you look at a pattern. Well, he's had his injuries, so that's why he hasn't quite had that success. And then you've got a Watts. Well, he was drafted to a bad situation where it's just a case of, well, it's a club without leadership. They were just gutting their list of all their veterans. So that really hurt his development. So, um, and, and then you look at, well, who are some of the best players from some of these drafts? Well, we look at, a well, a Nick Rewalt was the best from his draft. And we had one year where Pavlich was the best from his draft, but he didn't go number one. So um, in, in terms of all that, so, um, and then you've got a Goods. Well, he was sometimes a key forward, but he played also sort of, wing i suppose some midfield some ruck so you could really play him anywhere but he could play key forward so you've got still a number of key forwards that do justify that number one pick you've got a chris grant he was picked late in his draft year and i know back then the scouting wasn't great but so you do have some years where a key forward is the best from their draft and we've got in the swallow draft well a lot of people are going to argue for a tom lynch being that number one guy so is there is it a mistake to take a key forward number one well no it's not necessarily a mistake it just depends on i guess talent identification so um and did i have a mccartan number one in his draft year well no i didn't i had him probably number five or so and similar with a pattern i didn't quite have him number one i'm not even sure if i had boyd number one maybe i did i'd have to go back and look at that but um is it a mistake to take a key forward number one well I don't think so. This year I had Jamara and Logan McDonald as those number one guys. But um, there's other years where you look at some key forwards and you think, no, they shouldn't be as high as they're picked. And I could look at a Josh Shackey as a number two pick in the Josh Wiedering draft. Well, he isn't someone that I rated top five and he went pick two. So it really just comes down to talent identification there. But what I would say with regards to this idea is, well, key position players are probably taken on average, probably earlier than they should. And that's just because I think clubs reach based on needs. So it just really comes back down to the fundamental idea in the draft of you're drafting to take the best player. So I think really we just need to put the focus back on that. So um, yeah, so moving on to the next key idea that comes out of this, well, um, will we start seeing more number one picks become the best in the draft? And how often will we start seeing this? So if we look at the trends, so if we look at those, I guess, less successful ones, so we've only really got in the last, I guess, 10 years, we've got Boyd and McCarden, but the rest of them are really from, I guess, the 90s and 80s. So the success rate is improving in the D class, where you've got from the 80s, you've got 90s, you've got one from the thousands, from the tens. So we've had sort of incremental improvement and then you look at sort of i guess the newer guys well a lot of these guys in recent years will have they have the chance but it depends on durability depends on development um so we'll have to see with those but yeah sort of over time we've seen a gradual sort of i guess increase in hit rate i suppose to put it that way so i think we will start seeing more number one picks become the best and how often we'll start seeing it happen well Maybe it, I'd, I'd put a random estimate out there and say we could get maybe a one in four chance of the number one pick being the best in the draft, maybe even a one in three chance, maybe a 50-50 chance eventually. So we'll have to see. But what we have to remember, though, is we're taking these guys as 18-year-olds. And the difference between who you are as an 18-year-old and who you become as a footballer, well, over the span of the career, that really changes depending on, well, who are the veteran leaders in the club? What do you have in terms of coaches, whether it's the senior coach, assistant coaches, fitness staff, in terms of all the injury prevention people in the clubs? How's your body going to hold up? There's so many variables in play that we just, you never quite know. And well, on average, you're going to have the number one pick being sort of, I guess, going to a club that's pretty poor, unless they trade that number one pick, which rarely happens. So um, in terms of the opportunities to develop, well, it's a lot harder for those number one picks to develop. So I don't believe we'll ever get over a 50% hit rate with the number one picks, but I do think we'll get probably maybe a quarter of the time the number one pick will be that, I guess, person who should be. Maybe it's a third of the time. Maybe we get even up to half of the time eventually, but um, that is something to track. But certainly in looking at the more recent years, well, at this stage, well, yeah, I'd probably go Raul, I'd probably go Eugle Hagen, but that probably changes over the time. But with the other guys, mostly I'd be saying no. I think there's other guys who might be a smidgen better, but 
again it's a judgment call at this stage but yeah that's my take I'd be interested to hear what you guys think based on what we're seeing here but and then it also takes us on to well is the value of the number one pick rising now that we're gradually becoming more accurate picking early drafts so I believe that is slightly becoming the case so if we're to look through sort of I guess recent drafts the first round has been a pretty consistent place for the most part and particularly as you get earlier in the draft whereas if we go back many years well the consistency just wasn't there so we're gradually getting that slightly higher slightly higher hit rate with those earlier picks so um, yeah there definitely is strong value towards I guess maintaining that number one pick but um, there are some years where look you can get that evenness and it's a bit like in that Andy McGrath draft where like you could have any of those top really three picks where you could have a McGrath, Taranto, McLuggage where you could have any of them and really be very happy. So um, it, ultimately like there's other variables where you've got the evenness of the draft, sometimes there's a standout, sometimes there isn't. So um, yeah, there's a lot in play there, but yeah, I believe the number one pick is becoming slightly more valuable over time, but yeah, that's my take. If you've made it to the end of the video, well, congratulations, you've done very well. And um, yeah, so make sure if you haven't already, subscribe and hit the notification bell for future updates because I will be producing more videos. And let me know in the comments section below, well, is Hodge the real number one? Is it Nick Rewalt? Who do you prefer of those two? And of the young guys coming through, well, can a Matt Rowell or Sam Walsh or a Jamara, can one of those into that Nick Rewalt and Luke Hodge sort of company? That would be interesting as well to hear. So, and if you've got any ideas for future videos, let me know in the comments section below. I will read those and I'll definitely give due consideration to any video ideas. So thanks guys. See you in the next video.